They're bonding. They're bonding. It's time for a part two of the deep dive review of Winx Club, and this video is going to be about season five, and it's going to be structured a bit differently than the first video. We're gonna cover points by season instead of by category because this seasons, the next four seasons, are all quite different. So I need to cover them separately. I can't just put them in the same categories. Does it even look like a sailor hat? Season five marks a point of a drastic change for the Winx Club. This season does not feel like the previous seasons in a bad way. If you're a big fan of that season, maybe don't watch this. If you're easily offended, you know, because I'm going to be saying a lot of things about this season that you might not like. Let's start with the animation. This season has both 2D and 3D animation. Whenever Winx enter the Infinite Ocean, they are animated in 3D. The Infinite Ocean is like a special underwater realm. So with 2D animation, there are some good things about animation this season and some bad things about it as well. What is good about it is the fact that it is HD. I know that it's kind of expected of the modern cartoons to be in HD, but it is a new thing for the Winx, at least at that point it was new, so I wanted to mention that. The rigging in this series is rough though, just as in season 4 to be honest, with minimal improvements. This type of animation just doesn't hold a candle to frame by frame animation that we had in the first three seasons. There are a lot of awkward movements and every character, especially the main six girls, have the exact same body language, which wasn't the case for the first three seasons. Just look at this concert moment with Bloom. <gasps> I genuinely don't get why anybody would animate them like that. The good thing about those new animation techniques is that the effects applied are really cute. The underwater scenes look pretty great, with the light bouncing around the ocean's floor in a nice way. The backgrounds for transformations look great as well, with little details like Bloom moving the camera slightly in her harmonics transformation, adding a little bit more spice. Speaking of transformations, let's break them down. We get two transformations this season. Harmonics and Cyrenix. Cyrenix is the main transformation that the Wings are trying to achieve to defeat the main villain. So why in particular do they need Cyrenix to do that? Well, season 5 is the first season that has not a really great reason as to why the transformation is needed. The main reason is that Believix powers are not effective underwater, as well as the wings of Believix don't really work when they are wet either. It's a terrible reason for transformation and let me tell you why. First of all, Wings already had underwater fights before and the most ridiculous part is that they used to be able to use their powers, swim underwater just fine with some help from Aisha's powers to be able to breathe underwater. They could do that in their base form, okay? Cyrenix also gives an opportunity to enter the infinite ocean and this should have been the only reason they used to explain why they needed it. The whole point of Tritanus being so powerful that Winx needs something more powerful than Enchantix to defeat him is just not a good idea, especially when villains like Valtor were definitely stronger than this villain, mostly because in the case of Valtor, he actually collected so many spells from so many different realms that I don't think they're quite comparable to be honest. And Tritanus only stole the powers of Selkies. It doesn't quite make sense to be honest. We figured out the reason for Cyrenix's introduction. One valid reason, another one that's not so valid. Now what the hell is Harmonix for, right? Well, Harmonix was given to the Winx to allow them to swim faster and use powers freely in the ocean. No, I think that's Cyrenix actually. Um, wait, for harmonics, it, it will allow, allow you to swim faster and use, and your, use powers your powers freely. Oh. Okay, okay, all right. So there's no reason for harmonics then. Or considering that Selkis can open the gates to the infinite ocean, is there no point for Cyrenix then? Which one is pointless? You can guys, you can just pick one. I think that we should probably pick Cyrenix as a pointless one because I don't like its design. So harmonics, 
This transformation is pointless, yes, but pretty. I like the design. The only drawback is the fact that all of the designs are exactly the same for all of the girls. There are very marginal differences that don't really count as an actual difference, to be honest, because the silhouettes are the same, the wings are the same. There is a difference in terms of the symbol that's being animated on the wings, but it doesn't really make that much of a difference. It's a very cheap way of differentiating designs, just using a symbol. This is the point that I want to kind of talk about about right now or right away and that is the problem with the designs in the later seasons and that problem is the fact that their outfits are oftentimes the same now exactly the same with just recoloring counting as a different outfit even when those designs are good they're not individualized harmonics is definitely pretty i think it suits the underwater theme pretty well. The skirts kind of look like mermaid tails. I also think that Harmonix has cool spells like Musa's Diapason and Stella's Shiny Mirror spell too. When it comes to transformation sequences, Harmonix is not that interesting. There's a lot of repetition in the sequences between the girls with just a few things like Stella opening her transformation with her finger guiding the fabric or Bloom moving the camera slightly being the only differences that kind of add something to their transformations. At the same time, I do feel like the song fits the transformation pretty well too and it is one of the better songs in the later seasons as well. So when it comes to Sirenix, I like that Sirenix is gained by finishing a quest. It is a first for the franchise and it makes sense. I like some aspects of the transformation sequences as well as the song, but I hate the design though. I'm sorry, I really do. I do not like the leggings. I don't like how uniform the outfits are between the girls. The wings are the same. I do not like the pattern of the way that their hair gets every coloring. Just nothing about it is that appealing to me, maybe except for the arm accessories. And also the lack of cool spells really brings this transformation down. It's supposed to be really powerful. It's supposed to be more interesting than harmonics, but harmonics delivers a lot more. The spells are basically just stupid blasts. They have no character, no individualization beyond the color matching the wings as girls respective powers. The only exception is probably the cool blasts that come from their legs. I haven't seen that happen in Winx before and I haven't seen it done in a lot of shows or stories, magical stories in general, where people cast spells with their legs. That's a pretty new thing. But those spells were still blasts technically, so you know. If with harmonics I thought that the design was cute but the transformation sequence was kind of not delivering that well, I think that with Sirenix it's kind of the opposite, except I'm not as impressed by the transformation sequence of Sirenix as I am impressed by the design of harmonics. The transformation sequences for Sirenix, they feature a lot of cool things. Inspirations from martial arts, for example, for Tecna, reminds me of her Magic Wings transformation in terms of the opening. Musa's breakdance moves, I don't know what those moves are called exactly or if they even have a name, but it's definitely something breakdance related. Aisha's back layover taken straight out of a gymnastics routine. Sirenix also has two different versions, 2D and 3D, including the transformation sequences too. In the 3D version, we still get a few cool moves like Flora's skating inspired twirls as well as Tecna's kickflip. But I do have to say that even though I appreciate all of those influences, the new transformation sequences lack elegance. There's too much flavor flailing around involved and it is not necessary. Since Serenix allows the wings to enter the infinite ocean and become 3D animated, we're gonna talk about the 3D animation here. There are some good things about it like Tritanus's texture. I noticed that multiple times when I was watching this show that whenever he was really up close you could see a lot of texture in his face. I thought that was done really well. But none of the wings look like themselves. And before anyone says that of course they're not gonna look like 2D versions of themselves, of course they're not gonna look like themselves because it's 3D or whatever. We can take a look at the first movie where the girls do look like themselves. They still have the same kind of characterization in terms of their faces. Just look at Bloom in this screenshot. It doesn't look like Bloom. It looks like an entirely different person. I do not recognize who that person is and I don't understand why she's so far off from what she used to be because it is possible to make a good version of the girls. Even though I still don't like the way the hair was done in either one of these iterations of a 3D Winx Club, I am just shocked that none of the girls look like themselves at all. Look at Bloom here and compare her to the new version. 
here. I think that in this image, she actually looks like Bloom. And in this one, I just don't recognize her. And it's kind of the same thing with Flora, for example. I could not, for the life of me, differentiate Flora from just like a random character. When I was watching the show, I was just like, who, who is that? And I could only decipher that it's her by memorizing that her hair turned kind of purplish pink when she was in the water. That was it. Another thing that I used to praise a lot about this show was the fight scenes. And specifically their choreography. Wings is a type of show that features a lot of fight scenes. If the fights aren't good, it becomes difficult to watch. And that's exactly what happens in season 5 actually. Fight choreographies become poorly timed. They lack imagination in the attacks and dynamics. The way characters move takes you out of the moment. The tension isn't there, and I'm talking about tension that's built by using choreography. <laughs> <laughs> Not only are the fights boring visually, but they also lack banter. The wit just isn't there. How did we go from Go for it, Bloom, catch her! But be careful not to get your dress wet! If it shrinks anymore, you'll be in trouble! To Hello, Winx. Goodbye, Winx. Generic one-liners. Generic power blasts. It's just not good. The magic blast problem is so bad that even a spell that's about activating some magic clocks and viewing the past is done with a generic blast. Bloom literally smacks the clocks with a goddamn blast. Mm. Oh. Speaking of magic, it's doing just too much too quickly for everyone. Starting with episode 1 where they changed the oil tank thing into an eco-friendly power producing plant with like just one spell. Another thing you'll notice right away is just how bad the pacing is. It's so awkward, it makes you lose interest or focus right away. The effects to portray magic are cool, they look nice. Just as bubbles and sparkles look pretty good. I do still wish that the spells were more inventive, but you know, it is what it is. So the writing. I did not know where to start when I started writing this because there are so many issues with plot. I know that this is the first season that was co-produced with Nickelodeon and I heard what people thought of later seasons too, but I wanted to come into it with no preconceived notions just to be fair, you know, and not expect anything bad from the quality of the writing. I was quickly hit with so many plot points and writing devices that were difficult to watch that I looked up the group of writers that Nickelodeon put together to write the show and was unpleasantly surprised that the entire ensemble is Blue's Clues writers, people who were Blue's Clues writers in the past. You know Blue's Clues, the show that was written to target an audience of three-year-olds? Anyway, we're gonna cover the writing sort of chronologically, starting with the nonsense that Skies and Bloom's relationship is. Remember in the last video, I told you to set aside that information about Bloom and Sky getting engaged in the movie? Yeah, they seem to not be engaged anymore. I know that this is counting as somewhat of a soft reboot, but considering that they're still continuing the timeline, I cannot count it in as a reboot, it just doesn't count as such. You have to either restart the timeline entirely, or you have to take in consideration what happened before. The most ridiculous part is that they get engaged twice before season 5. Once in the first movie, and then second time in the second movie. I would understand if the producers and writers were kind of quiet about the engagement and tried to walk it back. Just because of how unrelatable it is to young people who are like 12, 10, whatever the demographic is for this season. But they walk it back so far that now we are dealing with a stupid plot about a pendant. Yeah, I got the pendant. Oh, by the way, remember Sky became king in the first movie? He's not a king anymore. He's a crown prince again. Because nothing counts anymore, you know? At least some things do count and then some things don't. It's all irrational and there's no logic to any of the decisions that were made for this season, which is really fun. Because who cares about the story when you think that kids can't put two and two together, right? So Sky wants to give Bloom the pendant of Raclium. This trinket is supposed to give happiness to the couple. 
and if the prince loses it, the couple will never be happy or whatever. So this couple that's been dating for like at least four years at this point is not getting along just because Sky is weirdly nervous about giving her that pendant. Then he loses the pendant and gets weird about that. Wait for it. This is not the most ridiculous part yet. Mm -mm. He then falls from a platform that's really up high and loses his memory. What is this daytime soap opera-esque plot? Then this girl Crystal tries to heal him, which is also fun because, you know, this season Bloom doesn't have her healing powers because why would the writers do their research, know the story? right? Another annoying thing is that Crystal can't heal him because there is a block and that block is created by Sky because he doesn't want to remember something and it is implied or at least it is shown that Sky doesn't want to remember that he lost the pendant and that's why he doesn't want his memory returned. <laughs> Do you hear how silly this is? Not to mention that neither Sky nor Bloom act like themselves. They're personalities are wiped. Then, as soon as you think that this is as stupid as it's gonna get, you know, we get the diaspora subplot. Yeah, that diaspora that was banished from being anywhere near the royal court after drugging Sky with a magic potion that Valtor gave her. And not only is she there and allowed to converse with Sky, but Bloom is once again jealous as if this is season one where Jasper hasn't done anything crazy yet and was Sky's actual fiance, you know? Sky's memories come back where not me forgetting to show Jasper's face when I was talking about her. <laughs> Sky's memories come back when the pendant is found, but what do you know? King of Heraklion not only has Diaspora in the palace, but basically gives her full control of Sky and his affairs by appointing her as the special liaison. How does this make any sense? Mm. Then a bunch of other things happen with Diaspora coming between Bloom and Sky, and none of it is interesting or new or logical. It is just so much nonsense. On the topic of couples, let's cover the rest of the nonsense that involves romance. Season 5 picks up right after the events of season 4. Aisha has just suffered a tremendous loss of her fiancé, Naboo. I've said it before in the previous deep dive that I don't think that it makes sense that Naboo died, especially considering that this is a permanent death. Now, if season 4 5 was continued in the same fashion as the previous seasons, it would maybe make sense that Nabu didn't come back to life. But in the universe that season 5 is presenting, this heavy topic of grief just doesn't fit anywhere because of how juvenile the writing is. This is exactly why the writers just drop this storyline and act like nothing happened after trying clumsily to address the issue. We get this brief moment in the first episode where Aisha is crying over Naboo and the next time we see that topic come up is when the girls are looking for the gem of self-confidence for the Serenix quest and they deal with nightmare illusion. Aisha gets such an intense illusion to compare to the other girls. Bloom gets an illusion about Diaspora taunting her, which is silly. Stella gets taunted by her own self, an image of her that tells her she cannot be a designer or that she's not going to succeed. And then we get Aisha being taunted by Naboo telling her that she let him die. Do you see how clumsy this is? Do you see how weird the approach to dealing with the grief is in this season? It just makes no sense. Bloom and Stella get illusions that are like at a 1 out of 10, and then Aisha gets a full 10 out of 10 straight up. And it just... why? Not only that, but this never gets addressed later in any shape or form. There was one plot point that kind of worked well and that is a conflict between Stella and Aisha where Stella is trying to set her up with a bunch of guys and Aisha is offended by her actions, rightfully so. At least it shows that the series remember that something happened, that Naboo died, you know? However, I don't think that Stella would do something like this. She would probably do something like this if you broke up with your boyfriend, but she wouldn't do something like that if he died, okay? In a show that doesn't mind taking back plot points, a show that doesn't mind recycling conflicts like Diaspora, Naboo should have definitely been brought back to life, especially with that loophole that was written into season 4 in that one scene. In 
any case, Stella and Brennan are fine, except for the fact that Stella lacks all of the good qualities that she used to have. She's my favorite Winx, but starting from this season, I have a hard time liking her. Her mannerisms are off. She used to be bubbly while also being flirty and alluring, and now she's just a spoiled five-year-old, which is such a regression for her character in so many ways. She's just not relatable anymore. The way they wrote her is so one-dimensional. It's such a shame. Her pursuit of the designer career is treated like a gimmick. Whenever she dresses the wings or anyone, she always gets it wrong the first time, with a lot of bad physical comedy surrounding those moments. Like the girls are always falling over or are overwhelmed by the designs and we'll talk about the designs later oh and another thing stella is now the fairy of the shining sun instead of the sun and moon i don't know what the reason for that change is was two celestial bodies too much for the writers to handle did they think the kids were gonna get overwhelmed by the complexity of a magic power that has two sources like what the hell is it then anyway the only good thing about this couple is that brendan is as hot as ever just look at him mm. Six inch pumps. So Flora and Helia. These two are also given a nonsensical storyline. Such a cringe scene to wrap it up. It's just ridiculous. I can't put the entire scene here because it's literally like three minutes long or something. But there is a scene where Flora is upset about being secure in a relationship and she is in a dance studio with the Winks and they encourage her to deal with it through dance. First of all, this scene shows off my biggest problem with this season and that is dialogue. It is is juvenile yes but it is also so incredibly shallow and insincere we are deprived of seeing actual friendship on screen instead we get these poorly written lines but we are your friends forever so open your heart and dance with us it is a big problem and I will expand on it in a minute. Next in the scene, Flora starts to dance and then she sees Helia and we are presented with the longest, unnecessarily drawn out scene of them dancing. And at the end, flying up, twirling and wailing each other's names. Oh, Helia. <laughs> Flora. I encourage you to watch that moment yourself. I'll leave a link in the description and a little like timestamp so you don't have to look for it. Just for you to grasp how awkward and weird the pacing and delivery is. This dancing part of the episode starts earlier than Flora's part and it goes on for way too long. Considering that this is one of the last episodes of the season, it was like episode 25 or something, it should tell you a lot about how messy the planning of this season is. If the last episodes that are supposed to be the climax of the story are stuffed with inconsequential filler. Since I mentioned the dialogue problem, let me expand on it here. I have a perfect example that will illustrate what I dislike about the dialogue, and that is the positive energy nonsense of episode 4. So Bloom is upset about Sky losing his memory, not remembering her, and after the obligatory, we all we support, support you. you. Winks go on to say this phrase, positive energy. They say it over and over again. After a weird aww sound from Bloom, from now on, positive energy. Yeah, positive energy. <laughs> positive energy. Positive energy. All of this reeks of something fake. Maybe it's a cultural thing because Wings never used to say things like mm -hmm. before. And I think I'm just not a fan of that. Especially with the empty, supportive statements that fairies passing by Bloom said like, hang in there. Hang in there. Thanks. All of them talk too much and do too little. And that is not only a recipe to being useless to people around you, but also a recipe for a terrible storytelling in a visual medium. Show me that the Winx and others support Bloom instead of writing cringe lines 24 seven. Now, let me ruin the plot for you real quick, unless you already noticed the issue. This season sets up a repetitive pattern for a sub story and rides it out until writers need to move on to the next plot point. Allow me to present the plot of five episodes of season five. Tritanus attacks a Selkie 
of the world the wings are conveniently going to because of the Serenic's quest. Three out of the six wings go to that world, while the other three are dealing with the tricks. One of the wings get bonded to the Selkie that was attacked earlier, while one of the wings say, Aww, Aww, they're, they're bonding. bonding. They get the object they were after in that episode. Yeah, this is a plot of not one, not two, but five episodes of this season. Listen, listen, I wouldn't be bringing this up if aside of the main plot points, these episodes were delivering something else in the dynamics, dialogue between the characters. But instead, we get all oh, their bonding over and over and over again. Aww, they're bonding. They're bonding. They're bonding. They're bonding. I think they're bonding. Oh look, they're bonding. They're bonding. There are some differences between those episodes, but unfortunately, they are not sufficient enough because of lack of personality in the characters themselves. Each one of the Winx girls are so one-dimensional now. With the differences between them being marginal and superficial, these character issues also affect the tricks too. Biggest issue being Icy. Icy is not herself at all, and I don't really mean the whole thing with Tritanas in terms of them dating or whatever, as much as I mean her personality. She's so subservient all of a sudden, which is not characteristic of her. We've seen the tricks when they were interested in a man, and that was with Valtor. And out of the three, the only one that I can see acting like this, being quite manipulative to get what she wants from this guy, would be probably Darcy, and even then it's debatable. This identity erasure spills from the writing section into the design section. Season 5 is where all of the characters objects and clothes start to lose any sense of individuality. Let's start with the design of the new original character, Selkies. I don't think they're a bad idea. They are kind of like pixies of this season. The problem is that they are not individualized. Yeah, I'm gonna say that word again. Because this is what happened this season. None of the designs are as versatile as designs from the first few seasons. In contrast to Selkies, pixies had different designs. Not only that, but in terms of writing, pixies just like like fairies all have their own unique sources of magic, like gossip for Chata, passageways and locks for Laquette, manners for Toon. Selkies, on the other hand, are all the same. They're powers are exactly the same too. The only difference is that cheap symbol trick, where when they blast the opponent with their magic, it first appears in the shape of a symbol that is related to the world that they are guarding. The guardians of Cyrenix are all the same for every girl too. In this case, I can kind of forgive it and not pay attention to it because they're all on the same quest, so it would make sense that the guardians in the boxes would be the same as well. I am a bit surprised that they would even add a recolor to them because they don't really have to be individual if they're using the logic of, oh, it's the same quest. This topic leads me to another issue that is similar in nature, and that is fashion in the show. Season 5 starts an era of identical outfits for Winx, and these outfits are not only matching, they're also ugly. Right at the beginning, the show opens up with the Winx band show. We are presented with these horrific eyesores for outfits right here. We went from cute pop-punk Avril Lavigne-inspired outfits that were individualized while also fitting the concept that they were going for as a group, to this mess. First of all, they're all wearing the same outfit. The accent colors matching their signature colors does not count as a unique character suited outfit. They are wearing ugly fedoras with this terrible, massive accessories on them and those vests with colorful collars. Next up are the gowns. First of all, they're all the same. Second of all, the design they copy pasted for the girls is not even pretty. They all have these massive flowers slapped on them in random patterns, and the flowers themselves are so poorly drawn, I cannot believe that they not only made them wear these atrocities, but also make them the featured pieces of the design. They look like really bad prom dresses. Also, what the hell is Stella's touch? You guys look great! Do I detect the Stella touch? Well... Of course! If Bloom didn't get it and still got those 
horrid flowers on her gown the disco slash party looks at least they're different from each other Musa, Aisha and Stella don't look that bad I actually think that Stella's outfit had potential but these three outfits don't look bad in the concept illustrations in the episodes themselves these outfits just don't look good I think I would find them relatively inoffensive if Bloom's outfit wasn't that bad it's just bad on such advanced level that i had to stop the episode and take a moment when i saw it for the first time from that white t-shirt that doesn't look like it's purposefully off shoulder but rather than it's worn out old t-shirt that you only wear to bed or to repaint your kitchen to the sports bra looking top layered over it the poorly fitting hairband with the messy hair look and those arm warmers with a black leather looking bracelet on one hand and a collection of baby teething ring looking bracelets on another it's just really something and don't even start me on these leggings from the start of season 5 the wings designers decided to forget about all hosiery that fits the occasion or outfit and just fucking go for the thickest leggings around and make them as one dimensional as possible okay so let's talk about some outfits that i did like the casual everyday outfits they look pretty cute i like the boots that they're wearing and the outfits are definitely created to suit each girl the only problem i have is that the overall mood and silhouettes of the outfits lack that aura of being fashionable in conventional ways while also creating something interdimensional with the style these outfits have a dash of that jojo siwa flair that is entirely too foreign to a cartoon originally created in italy with prada and versace designers creating the girl's signature looks in any case i also like the pajama outfits i especially loved muse's hair it is so cute my grandma used to force me to wear my hair like that and I hated it back then except without the front two pieces hanging out but now I think it looks great the explorer outfits are copy paste kind of unfortunately but they are not a bad design I mean it is hard to ruin a catsuit but still and it reminds me of the matching outfits the girls wore to Domino in the first season I like the winter outfits the girls wore on Dineth the fur and all the fun accessories I also think their hair is really cute here I'm also gonna say something potentially surprising or controversial but I like the sailor outfits hence this look hmm? Hmm? They seem very similar because of the nautical theme But they are actually quite different Considering they do have to stick to a theme By the way, there's a trick I use to determine whether an outfit that has a lot going on Is campy to the point of being really cute Or if it's a poorly designed mess Just imagine it in a fun pop music video with a high budget and a very specific concept Does it look cute in that context or not? This sailor outfit would look cute as hell With the potential to become iconic I I did not like the swimsuits this season they're all the same and the design is not cute and the worst design offense of this season is Stella's fashion collection I don't know if the creators of the show know this but fashion collections require you to have different pieces presented at the show you can't just have six dresses with marginal differences be the entire collection the worst part is that the entire season they are trying to convince us that Stella would actually design this mess stop offending my girl Stella she deserves better come on now when it comes to the world building we are dealing with a continuation of the series with an established universe that doesn't get fleshed out as much as it should this season however we do see new worlds even if mostly underwater we are once again focusing on Aisha's world Andros so Andros gets to show off again but we don't really get to see more of the world or at least that much more of the world as much as we revisit places that we've already been to those places being revamped sometimes like for example the underwater realm of Andras is not a queendom anymore with female guards but a kingdom with male guards I don't know why I changed and I I, I was very excited to see Zenith we did not see Technus realm ever before and it is um, pretty place that they did 
did really well in designing it looks a bit dystopian in this season it doesn't look like that in season six i think because maybe the weather was kind of adding to that aspect we also get to see melody again even though just a couple of places like underwater place and the wharf but still it's nice to see it now let me introduce you to the new segment called uh, why list where i put all the miscellaneous grievances that i have in a list and stick it on my wall so i can violently slap it with my pointer the way Tritanus escapes and gains power okay listen that whole prison break scene was so silly it bothered me so much right away everything that happens is just too much of a lucky coincidence Tritanus needs his trident to escape it's right there kept right where he can see it a few meters away from his cell because why wouldn't they keep it right there just as soon as he says that he needs the trident to get out and he can't easily access it a cloud of pollution appears out of nowhere and conveniently flows to tritanus all contained in that one cloud formation also that the whole thing of turning guardian mermaids into monsters is so valtor they're even on andros too it's just ridiculous can you stick to transformation logic, please? First and foremost, when we see the wings transform this season, before any transformations are introduced, new transformations, they transform into Belivix, which is already a problem because Belivix was only necessary on Earth and only before magic was returned to Earth. At the end of season four, all of the girls are back to Enchantix form because this is their most powerful form technically. Now this season they are using Belivix for some unknown reason and then after that they gain harmonics specifically to use underwater. So why on the fuck of the earth are we seeing them transform into harmonics to fight tricks entirely above water? And the most annoying part is that harmonics is not supposed to be more powerful it's supposed to let them use their power underwater but the rioters decided to give us the tired trope of they're not supposed to be this strong yes but we are and it's so cringy i'm just tired of them disregarding not only the lore that came before them in previous seasons but even the lore that they created themselves this season why are all the other fairies suddenly useless? What I liked about the first few seasons was that the wings were just like the rest of the fairies at Althea. In battles at the school, everyone else transformed and fought against whomever was attacking them. This time we just get a bunch of Althea students running around, not trying to protect themselves from attacks at all, which is so stupid. Why wouldn't they transform? why wouldn't they try to combine their powers to stop the attacker who came up with that we already pay attention to wings because they are the main characters there is no need to make every other magical being in the dimension inept for us to pay attention to them why is Tritanus torturing Daphne for information about Cyrenix? Just, he is somehow always one step ahead of the girls he coincidentally, serendipitously follows the Serenix path without that information. At least <laughs> make it make sense just a little bit. Why is he always in the right place? If he somehow knows where to go, why does he need to torture Daphne to get that information from her? Come on now. From hotty to naughty. I wish Tritanus was in his hot form for most of the time, okay? I see liking him when he looks like that. It just doesn't make sense. Remember what Trick said about Valtor when he changed into his monster form? Ugly! Yeah, exactly. The last riddle of the Serenix quest was silly and cringy. The last riddle about looking within yourself was just too much, man. It was so bad. The wings literally go researching again. Like, that makes sense. And after searching for a while, the solution is found by Bloom, who just goes, maybe Dad, we, we should, should look, look inside, inside ourselves. ourselves. They then proceed to stand in a circle. So maybe that's how we will find the source of Sirenix. Yeah. Bloom takes the Sirenix box out and after saying some generic words, the guardian goes, well done fairies, you passed the final test. The final test? I beg your pardon? This is such lazy writing. I want to smack something, so let me smack the wall. <laughs> Selkies look ridiculous as an army and they are absolutely useless at guarding anything, including the gates. They are so tiny. And for some reason, the creators of the show decided to create an army out of them and have them fight the mutants. It just looks comical. Just 
why threat greater than the ancestral witches. At that summit of the never-ending monarchs of the magical dimension, we get this statement from Bloom's parents about how Tritanus is the greatest threat to the magical dimension since the ancestral witches. And I just cannot at this point. Tritanus just took the power of like six to seven selkies with his stupid trident and somehow he's supposed to be more powerful than the ancestral witches pardon valtor too the guy who was also made out of the dragon's fire and stole a bunch of spells from all the dimensions seriously tritanus with his dirty shrimp ass <laughs> oh no hobo in Musa's memory of her childhood, we get to see her around the age of like six to seven, maybe nine or something like that. I would say six to seven with her mom and dad. First of all, Musa is too old in that memory because her mom died when she was like three to four. But second of all, her dad is an old man in that memory to compare to her mother when in reality, he's supposed to look like this. So what the heck is going on? Even if her mom in that memory was just an illusion or just a memory of the memory, whatever. Her dad wouldn't look like what he looks like 15 years later when just three to four years passed. Do you understand what I mean? Musa's Sirenix wish. Not only does Musa not get her Sirenix wish, Fulfilled. She also gets a moment when she contemplates, even though she never ends up using it for anything else. She thinks about wishing for her mom to come back and to be alive. And for some reason, she says that it would not be right to wish for that, which is really interesting because Bloom gets to wish for Serenic's curse to be over, consequently returning Daphne to life. And that wasn't a bad thing to do. Sirenix is not a thing that every fairy gets at some point. It's not enchantix. So there is genuinely no point in removing the curse off of Sirenix except for getting Daphne back. Bloom literally gets everyone in her family back. She gets to resurrect Sky in season two with her healing powers. But for some reason, Naboo and Musa's mom cannot return. You can't keep resurrecting people for Bloom, even if Daphne is not technically a resurrection and just making her corporeal, and leave Aisha and Musa to deal with their grief that never actually gets dealt with because it doesn't get as much attention as needed to address it. Naboo was in a coma and this show decided to keep him as dead. But Bloom gets like 300 people resurrected and returned to life in one way or another. The sword and the mutants. Aisha's underwater relatives are turned into mutants by Tratennis. And that was mostly the reason why the Winx couldn't do anything about them when they ran into them and they had to like retreat or wait and not attack Tratennis, basically because he used them to protect himself. However, Aisha got King Neptune's sword from her father that has powers to revert mutants back to normal. And in episode 16, she uses it to restore Nares, Nereses, Nares, Nereses, and Tressa. Tell me now, why in the hell have they not used the sword since in the situations where they needed to turn mutants back to normal? I'm just curious what, what the reason is. If it's just because Nereus has it, wouldn't it make sense for him to do it? And if he's usually not there for these battles, why doesn't Aisha have it for now? Just don't get it. Anyway, here are my grievances and praises for season 5 of Winx. Let me know what you think. Leave a like or like a comment or subscribe, whatever. And I'll see you soon. Bye.